Good to be with you. So, Angel and I, before we moved here, we, we lived in a small house, like less than 1,100 square feet for about three years. And I mean, up to the last days we moved out, we still had boxes in the garage that we had not like gone through. So three years in, uh, we had just, so a hobby of mine, I, I like, you know, working with my hands and stuff. And I used to work with a contractor. And so I spent three years kind of renovating this house. And I mean, I just finished it right as we were leaving. So uh, we had just not, I think it was weeks before there was this, the blue room, anybody got a blue room in their house or something like it where everything goes to that room. We have boxes, all kinds of stuff that we had just processed all that stuff. Right as we were about to, to move out, um, we hadn't really like totally moved in yet, but in a sense, we, we were so moved in. Uh, because over three years, we really knew our neighbors. Uh, on the west, there was Paul and Francis. Um, Paul was in his 90s, uh, an electrician who always offered any tool that he had. I went over to his, where he was also a woodworker, I went over to his his woodworking, you know, area. They got stuff for our kids for their birthdays. When, you know, Paul got sick, you know, we went and visited him, gave them a meal. They took care of us. We took care of them. Uh, across the road, Bill and Marsha, they had like, they put my tomato plants to shame, which isn't hard to do, especially this year. They said, if you ever need a tomato, just don't even ask. Just come over, pick, pick some tomatoes, go home. Uh, on the other side was Greg and Becky. Greg and I did not see eye to eye on many things. But I sat in his house. He sat in mine. We had lots of conversations. Come to find out his mom is a pastor. He had lots of opinions. Greg, if you're out there, I love you, man. And so do I. Uh, when they when they went on vacation, we took care of their place. When we went on vacation, they looked after ours. We had heard some stuff about the neighbors behind us. Guess what? Angela said, let's go back there and talk to them. We did. They were just fine people. Never once had a problem with them. Three years. It's funny how that works. We, we hadn't really moved in, but we had moved in. And I, I just get the sense, like now, I think we're more moved in. We, we got all the boxes unpacked, but I've noticed at least in my neighborhood, people are less willing to kind of be talked to. They want to hide out. And I wonder if it's gotten worse in our times recently. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm, if I'm the weird neighbor and it's gotten worse that people like look out, is he out there? Because if he is, he's going to talk to me. <laughs> Angel, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. I, I, yeah. Uh, but we're getting to know our neighbors and build relationships there. But I, I just have the sense that we've not really moved in to the places where we already live in our lives. So our neighborhoods, our places of work, places where we you know play the places where we get our hair cut we we've not really moved into the places where we live but boy we've moved in on facebook i got some connections on there we're more connected than we've ever been and lonelier than we've ever been i don't think there's any uh accident to that so i read this article from somebody who has a doctorate in psychology uh, and she said, this was in 2019, she cited a survey that said nearly half of Americans always or sometimes feel alone or left out. Two in five Americans sometimes or always feel, that's sometimes or always, feel that they are isolated from others. One in five reports that they rarely or never feel like there are people they can talk to. 
It's uh, pretty wild. Today, almost 80% of Americans use social media, 69% of adults use Facebook, yet all that connecting hasn't reduced our feelings of disconnect and loneliness. Why? Go ahead. Why? What do you think that is? All that connecting hasn't reduced our feelings of disconnect and loneliness. Why? What do you say, Angel? We need, we need real human interaction. Yeah. It's, it's not as authentic as being in person. Yeah. Can one of y'all track online for me? Okay, thank you, Joanna. Make sure we're here. Nothing yet. Right. Yeah, Dave, maybe you could teach us a class later on. We'll stay after you tell us how to stay away from from all that. I was reading that um, a perspective of another mental health expert who she was kind of being snarky when people say I've researched it. So she's a professional researcher and she was like, well, let me have you done and she started laying out all these steps for research and she said a lot of times what people mean by research is they read something that showed up in their timeline that works according to some algorithm out there that feeds you stuff that you like according to your bias so you're getting stuff put up on your timeline that the algorithm says hey ross is gonna like this boom and then i read it and i'm like yeah i knew it man I knew it. I'm going to share this. Did my research. You know, it is. Yeah, oh yeah. Social dilemma. Yeah, it's, it's, it's troubling for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I have no research. I, I'm going to contradict everything I just said, and I'm just going to throw a theory out there I've done no research on. I, I feel that social media is the new is the new substance or drug of our time. It's the new numbing mechanism of our time and has been for the last couple decades. It's the new dopamine rush. Um, the author of this article says that real connections are built over time in small exchanges of mutual openness, curiosity, empathy, and generosity. Humans need real connections with others to thrive. As Dr. Brene Brown of the University of Houston explains, quote, we are psychologically, emotionally, cognitively and spiritually hardwired for connection, loving, and belonging. Connection along with love and belonging is why we are here. It's what gives meaning to our lives. So with that in mind, listen to this. I don't think that we could overestimate how much we are hardwired for that connection. Um, Think about this. You heard it in the poem that I read at the beginning. Christ dwelt among us and yet did not force, will not force our allegiance because real connection cannot be built on force. It's mutual. Give and take. That's real connection. We just heard a song from John, like an old worship song. Our, our God is mighty to save. How does God save us? from the powers of evil, our fear of death, the mistakes we keep on making. Listen to this. In one account of Jesus' life, um, He talks about what's called the Word. 
So I'm going to read that in just a minute. When he says the word, quote, the word, he means like he's referencing back to the very beginning of the Bible when God spoke something and things came into being. So the word is like God's mind, God's heart, God's power to bring things, new things into be, being. Think of it about like this. The word is like God's brain, the brain of creation. Look what it says here. How did God save us? The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. God, didn't, God isn't trying to fix things from a distance. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like Father, like Son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. That's John 1.14 um, in the message paraphrase. I'm just going to keep asking, it. have you moved into the places where you already live? Do you know the names of your neighbors? You know their stories. Have you invited them to something bigger and better? Have you moved into the places where you where you already live? I'm going to say a prayer for a minute, and then we're just going to dive into that question just a little bit longer. And for the next four weeks, we're going to think about how do we how do we do that. How do we practice neighboring well? Let's pray. God, thank You that You are with us. Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh. You walked alongside us. You walk alongside us. You've told us You will be with us until the end of the age. Though we make ourselves out to be Your enemies, You treat us as friends. You give Your life to send us a message to conquer the things that separate us in our minds from You. What can we do but love You back and love our neighbors? Help us to do that. And be with us even now as we think at a heart and soul level about how to live. In Jesus' name, Amen. So, I'm going to turn it back over to you. What um, If you think about neighboring well, the, the name of the series is Neighboring or Neighbor is a Verb. Uh, if I would have been on top of it, I would put up an image that I developed. It's on, we put it up on Facebook today where it says Neighbor is a Verb and it talks about meeting people where they are on their turf, investing in close relationships, reconsidering your enemies, uh, doing something for somebody else, putting them first, even above yourself, listening to their story with curiosity, sharing your story. What do you think are the barriers to that? We've already talked about social media, but what do you feel are the things that keep us from practicing neighboring well, that keep us from loving neighbors well? So it feels like an interruption. We're going to address that next week. Fear of how will they react? How will they receive my being a neighbor well? Yeah.
So, so we're interacting with someone as a means to an end. Like we got to get to a certain result. If we don't get that result, what will happen to me? Oh my God. Fear of rejection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Christy was like, fear of commitment, like fear of cost. Like if I sign up for neighboring well, I'm going to have to like keep showing up. This might actually place some constraints on, on my life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, uh it's that it's that fine line. I mean, the command says love your neighbor as you love yourself. We we can't we talked about this recently. You can't do everything for everyone. You can't do something for everyone, but you can do something for somebody. But sometimes we know we have us that if I open this door Man, <laughs> who knows? Anything online? Yeah. We already talked about how we're bombarded with connections and stimulation, but we're starving for neighbors. Like think about if you literally think of a neighborhood, I think about mine, like that that survey says at least half of the people in my neighborhood are struggling significantly with loneliness. Half. Um I know because I'm on Empower Johnson County, which is a youth focused drug prevention coalition in our county. Our our students feel so lonely. So lonely. So disconnected. Um, sure, go ahead, Angel. I do know that, Angel. Yeah. Mhm. Mm yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Angel is talking about, I know Angel, Angel neighbors a lot. So we might have a master class sometime. Angel may teach it. She knows everybody in her neighborhood. Um, you know, we talked about that last week. Like the biblical writers took very seriously human evil at work in the world, but also a spiritual evil. And we talked about that a lot last week. Um, go ahead, Sue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, COVID has definitely intensified. You know, I I had I thought about that. COVID, we were already lonely and disconnected and COVID just like drove it up. It's not like we were all doing great. And then the pandemic came along. I was like, "Oh, this has been a bit tough." Life was already like isolation and disconnection were already trending up and then COVID happened. And now you add division to it. Um, sure. 
Yeah. I, the part of what I, the last thing I said, I think the struggle with neighboring in our time is we are living distant relationships. We're, we're learning that. We're learning a way of practicing distance, distant relationships, which in a way is not so bad. But that is also giving us more of an ability to label from afar. It's easier to draw a label over somebody's life if you're distanced from them. If you're sitting with them one-on-one -on -one at lunch, it's hard to just keep them in the box of that label. When you sit with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to become a real living, breathing human being to you. And you're not going to like it sometimes because they're going to think things that you really disagree with, but they're going to have other things that you're like, I don't like this, but I kind of agree with you on that point. Right? Caleb. Yes. The most neglected part, I, one of the most neglected things in the history of Christianity, I would wager, um, is that second clause, as you love yourself. Uh, a lot of Christianity has been built on fear and shame, like not loving yourself. Like you should feel unworthy. Luckily, God still loves you even though you're unworthy. No, we're all created in the image of God. I mean, God wouldn't like come and become, become flesh and move into our neighborhood if God didn't give a darn and see something worth it in us. Yeah. Here's what I want to think about with you just to, we're just going to kick this off today. And then, like I said, for the next four weeks, a couple of things. I want to show you how Jesus' neighbors begin to do that. Uh, in it's in, uh, I believe it's in Luke's version. Yeah, it is, which we'll look at next week. In Luke's version of uh, a sequence between two people, there's a legal expert. So he's a guy in Jesus's religion who really knows the first five books of the Bible. Knows them front to back. And he comes and asks Jesus, like, hey, what do I need to do to obtain eternal life? We'll talk more about that next week. That whole phrase, obtain eternal life. And Jesus asks him in Luke's version, well, how do you interpret the law? And the law means the first five books of the Bible. He says, well, basically, I think it comes down to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In other accounts, it's Jesus who says that. In this account, whoever's writing this account remembers an exchange when it's the legal expert who says, I think that's what it boils down to. And Jesus comes back, he's like, no, man, you've got it all wrong. No, he doesn't. He says, listen to what he says back to this guy. Guy's question is, what do I need to do to obtain eternal life? He says, his interpretation of the law is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, do this and you will live. Guy asks, how do I obtain eternal life? Jesus' response is, do this and you will live. Jesus acts like, <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> it's, uh, when we neighbor well, like Jesus does, we're doing what makes us really live. When we practice neighboring well, like Jesus does, we're going to wake up to the eternal life that's moving into the world. When Jesus moved into the neighborhood, eternal life moved in with him. Eternal life is taking over the earth. That's why the name of our church is Heaven Earth. You probably know that by now. The direction of salvation is that not that we're escaping earth to go to a paradise resort. No, the kingdom of heaven is near. It's moving into earth. When Jesus moves in, eternal life moves with him. And he says, if you neighbor well, it's like you're going to wake up from a slumber. You're going to wake up to what living is. Watch how he does it. Just listen to this. I'll just read you this account at the uh, John 1. Watch how the Son of God 
practices neighboring. Watch how the Son of God practices neighbor as a verb. And by the way, if you think that like rivalries are tough in our time, political divisions, Jesus' time was 50 times worse. Battle lines were drawn between social classes, racial classes, ethnic groups, rich, poor. I mean, it was like there was a division for a division for a division. And Jesus became flesh in the lowest division. That should tell you everything about God's heart. This is how the Son of God saves the world. The next day, this is... Chapter 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Galilee is a freshwater lake in northern Israel. So here's Galilee. See, Jesus is from Nazareth down here. He's going to journey up here to Capernaum and uh, Bethsaida. He's going to hang out here for a while that's already practicing neighboring well. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. When He got there, He ran across Philip and said, come follow Me. Good neighboring point number one. Philip's hometown was Bethsaida, the same as Andrew and Peter. Jesus is from Nazareth. He goes on the other side of the lake knows Philip by name and, and invites him. Like, hey, let's hang out. Philip went and found Nathaniel and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law. First five books. They were waiting for this, this anointed figure. Christ means anointed one. Messiah means anointed one. They were waiting for this person to restore Israel. We found him. It's Jesus, Joseph's son, the one from Nazareth. Nathaniel said, Nazareth? You got to be kidding. You, you serious? Come on, man. You got to be kidding. Watch the neighboring Philip practices. Come see for yourself. Come with me. He's already doing it. Second generation, it's already happening. Jesus says, come follow me. Philip says, Nathaniel, come follow me. Come with me. Let's go together. When Jesus saw him coming, he said to Nathaniel, there's a real Israelite. Not a false bone in his body. Nathaniel said, where did you get that idea? You don't know me. <laughs> oh, man. Jesus answered, one day, long before Philip called you here, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathaniel is like, whoa. Whoa. He exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Do you see how quick that shift happened? One minute he's like, from Nazareth? you got to be kidding me. You don't know me. Next line, you are the Son of God. The art of neighboring. If you take time to show someone that you see them, You've noticed them. You've seen them and you've noticed them. Not just known their name. And you speak that to them. Something's going to be resuscitated in their soul. That happens for Nathaniel. Jesus said to Nathaniel, you've become a believer simply because I say I saw you one day sitting under the fig tree. You haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> Before this is over, think about what I just said about the city of heaven coming to earth. 
There's a new channel open. There's not a great divide like heaven's breaking into earth. He says before this is over, you're going to see heaven open and God's angels descending to the Son of Man and ascending again. There's going to be a highway open between heaven and earth. A new traffic. A new highway built. You're going to see heaven breaking in. You think it was a big deal? I saw you under the fig tree. Wait till you see this. All right, back to you in the studio. What does neighboring well look like according to that story? If we're going to pra- if neighbor is a verb, not something we, not a noun that we just sit back and passively are like, yeah, I'm a neighbor. I have neighbors. Instead, it's like waking up like, God, help me to neighbor well today. What does neighboring well look like according to that story? Communication. Thoughtful communication. Prayerful communication, yeah. What else? Reaching out of your comfort zone. Going across to the other side of the lake. Instead of sitting in Nazareth and going, man... That'd be cool. How cool would it be if Philip and Nathaniel like came over here? Meeting people where they are. You know what's weird? I think that's one of the five core values of Heaven Earth Church. Oh, it is. It's number one. Like geographically, literally, spiritually, emotionally, meeting people where they are and not requiring that they meet you on your turf. Better time management so that it can be a better priority in your life. Yeah. Finding out the needs of your neighbors. I might add one thing, the needs and the gifts. Uh... We all have needs, like Mr. Rogers said. We all need help from at one time or another. We also have everybody in this room. There's a multitude of gifts in this room. There's a multitude of gifts out there. Our value says we want to meet people where they are and see them as masterpieces. Ephesians two ten says that we all we are all masterpieces created in Christ Jesus for good works. We all are. What else? What's neighboring well in this story? Yeah. Yeah, you're you're intentional. You take a risk to to cross a bridge with with your speech. Including others. Yeah. Not waiting until the ground is common between us. Because it already is, right? If we're all made in the image of God, the ground's already common. So, maybe one or two more. What's neighboring well look like in that story? Connecting face to face. Yeah. 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 Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. Dave was telling a story about how his neighborhood had a block party 
and he made a vow this morning how weird that we're doing this to know not weird to know the names of the people in your neighborhood and heard a story about uh, a pastor reaching out to someone who had made derogatory comments um, and just the connection resulted in a guy making a different decision angie we're gonna say something Oh, you were. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We got one more and then we it's we're at time. Go ahead. Yeah. Instead of starting with what you don't like, don't don't go into relationships looking for what you don't like. Um, all right, so here's the deal. Talking about this stuff is fantastic. I'm going to have the same charge every week, and I'm going to practice it with you. I have someone identified in my neighborhood. I know the names of about everybody who lives, but there's someone diagonally for me. I know they just had a baby. Good Lord, I know what it's like to have a new baby. It's their first. I don't know their name. We have offered to help them zero. That's going to change this week. Who, who? What about you? What's your step to move into the place where you already live? It might be at work. It might be where you learn. It might be where you play. How are you going to really move in and neighbor well in those spaces. You cannot, talk about loving yourself well, you cannot be all things to all people. You cannot do something for everyone. But there is a somebody that God can lay on your heart right now. I know another piece for this church is we are moving into this building. We've not really moved into this neighborhood yet. We're trying to be better about it. Um, we got neighbors right back there. Um, there are some things we had done. What we we had a meeting one night, like a leadership meeting. We had we had food left over. We we went around to the houses around here, and somebody we brought them a tray of food. That's just a start. Who's that for you? Um, Let's close here. I swear this will be it for today. You might be thinking to yourself, Ross, I like what you're saying, but I think this is for introverts, or for, excuse me, for extroverts. I mean, I, I'll root for the extroverts to do it well. I, I want to do it. Well, I think you're wrong. Uh, I got to find the heart. I'm going to share this article on social media today. I'll also email it out on the, so some of you, maybe you're like, I'm quitting social media. In fact, I've doubled down on that today because of this conversation. I'm going to quit social media. So there's a story of a guy who is a public figure who he, he talked a really good talk publicly. And I always wondered like, man, did he really do it? behind closed doors so he goes to this church not it's not his public persona or whatever uh and his wife at that church uh talks to a man at the church and says like keep saying like you got to meet my husband you got you got to meet my husband and uh he's like yeah yeah like we would like okay yeah good and like i don't want to meet your husband I want to sing in the choir and go home. Well, eventually, the guy I'm talking about goes to the 
the man himself and says, can we go to lunch? How terrifying. Can you imagine going up to somebody in this church and saying, hey, can, I, can we go to lunch so I can just learn your story? Oh my God, you are, how, what's your anxiety level like now? You're not asking me to do that, are you? He takes him out to lunch. They go to lunch. Man, it's wild. Here's a quote from this man who met Mr. Rogers when they went out to lunch. He said, I'm an introvert or an extrovert. He's an introvert. He listened. I never shut up. Clemens said of their first meeting, that was a magic combination made in heaven. It wasn't too long later they were taping Fred Rogers' Ode to Civility um, at the local studio. And Clemens said, quote, I practically fell through the floor when Fred asked me to be a police officer on the show. He said with a laugh, I thought he doesn't know what he is asking me. Clemens grew up a black gay man in Youngstown, Ohio, where he witnessed abuse at the hands of police officers. Some policemen, he says, are the devil incarnate, but he recognized that not all police, police officers were bad. They were an essential part of a neighborhood. The first to arrive when calamity strikes and a child needs help, he and Rogers talked through what his character would be and how he could be a force for good. It was a heavy load, Clemens said. But he said he had Roger's support. The two formed a bond both on and off screen, one that Clemens described as a, quote, deep spiritual relationship. Mr. Rogers was practicing it off screen more than he was practicing it on screen. Because he was gay, Clemens said his father and stepfather never truly embraced him. Rogers, he said, became his surrogate father, the one he could turn to for guidance and advice in times of need. Clemens said it wasn't long before I realized what a healing presence this man was. Unlike my parents, he was not going to be judgmental. My parents were very negatively judgmental, so I couldn't share my deepest feeling or insecurity or inadequacy, but I could with Fred. Last part from this article, I'll share it online and be email. On screen, the two used their bond to combat racism. During a famous 1969 episode, Clemens and Rogers sat and soaked their feet in a miniature plastic swimming pool. In the United States at that time, black people were barred and even assaulted for trying to enter public swimming pools in many communities. Rogers then helped dry Clemens' feet. Um, he called, Clemens called Rogers a gentle radical. They, in this deep spiritual relationship, they fanned the flame of the Holy Spirit in each other and did this like incredible thing. So it all started. It all started <laughs> with Mr. Rogers asking him out to lunch. Go ask somebody to lunch this week. Go know the name of somebody whose name you have not known yet. Listen curiously to their story as if God is in them because God is in them. And then let the Holy Spirit, don't get so locked up about like, but where might this go? Let the Holy Spirit show you the next step. Go neighbor well. Hey, thanks for being here today. Um, the next three weeks, we're going to keep going with neighbor as a verb. We'll keep working on this together. I'm going to ask you next week, how did it go? And we'll see. Um, all right.